Engineered natural products like lab-grown meat and synthetic milks represent the next step in food science. But striving to make a product identical to one found in nature can raise issues regarding the patentability of that product. Finnegan attorneys Virginia Karen and Jess Marks join us now to discuss the current landscape for obtaining patent protection for engineered natural products. Jess, the Supreme Court's decision in Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics, Inc. played a significant role in the patentability of natural products. Tell us about the case and the impact of the court's opinion. Well, the Myriad case was decided by the Supreme Court in June of 2013. Now, you may recall that case because it made headlines at the time because it involved claims to the BRCA genes that are indicators of breast cancer risk. And I think most people remember it as a case that said that genes could not be patented, but that summary is so general that it borders on inaccurate. In that case, it's important to note that only two types of patent claims were involved, and we're going to get into some science here, but bear with me a bit. It will become clear why this science is necessary in just a little bit. So there was one set of claims that were directed to naturally occurring genomic DNA for the BRCA gene, and then there were other claims directed to the corresponding complementary or cDNA sequences. What's important is the difference between these two types of sequences. So genomic DNA is a sequence that you would find naturally occurring in your chromosomes. It has parts that are called exons that are expressed as proteins and interspersed between the exons are introns that are not used to code the protein. The fact that Myriad identified the genomic DNA for the BRCA gene is a great scientific discovery, but that's what it is. It's a discovery of something that existed in nature. The cDNA, however, is a DNA sequence that can be thought of as derived from the genomic DNA. It contains all of the exons in the genomic DNA, that's the part that's expressed as our proteins, but it does not contain the interspersed introns. Now, usually cDNA is a sequence that does not exist in nature. It's a useful invention because, as I mentioned, the exons are how the proteins in our bodies are expressed. And so you can see how the exon portions of genomic DNA being translated into proteins can be a valuable invention there. But it's important to note that there needs to be some kind of human intervention to create that cDNA. So in the Supreme Court case, when they were considering those two types of claims, those directed to the genomic DNA and those directed to the cDNA, the court found that the claims to the genomic DNA for the BRCA gene sequence were not patentable. But the claims to the BRCA cDNA, which did not exist in nature and which requires human intervention to create them, those were patent eligible. So the Myriad case can be thought of as providing one guidepost to inventors when pursuing product claims in their patent applications. You want to have claims that are directed to a non-naturally occurring product. If the product is indistinguishable from what is found in nature, then the claims directed to that product will be a bit difficult to patent. I agree, Jess, but it is important to note that the Myriad case only dealt with one type of patent claim, and as you stated, that's the patent claims that were directed to the product itself. But let's say you invented a new type of meat, something that you engineered in a lab. Let's say, for example, you found a way to make meat that was biologically and chemically identical to chicken. But again, you developed that in a lab without using the natural product. You could try to patent the engineered meat, but if the final product is really indistinguishable from the regular chicken meat, then you might have a difficult time getting any claims that cover the meat itself. But there are many other types of claims that could be patented and give you some protection for your invention. Virginia, that leads perfectly into the next question. A common challenge in this sector is patenting a replica of something that already exists in nature. How is this obstacle successfully addressed? The product claim is certainly probably the most widely used, but there are method claims which can protect how you make or use a product. There are claims that are known as product by process claims, and those claims give you rights to the product, but only if made by the process that you also describe. So that type of claim might be very useful in engineered foods, but it would allow someone to make a similar or the same product using a different process. 
And there can be product claims themselves that go to things that are related to the meat that we were describing. So, for example, maybe pieces of the machinery that you use or the technique that you use to develop the chemical combinations that you put into the end product. So it's still possible to get claims directed to the final product, even under Myriad, but you just have to be careful about how you describe the product and what you do. The most explicit example I can give you is if it's actually something that's found in nature, then it may not be eligible unless there's been some type of change to it. Something is different about it, either structurally or functionally. And the PTO has provided some great guidance on this in their guidelines that are issued every couple of years. And so you're going to have to stay abreast of what the PTO is doing. But if you do that, there should be a way to still protect what you've come up with. Jess, wording can often make or break a patent application for engineered food or natural products. What should companies do to make sure their application isn't rejected? Drafting a good patent application is an art, it's a science, and it's a skill. So one of the most difficult aspects of drafting applications in a cutting-edge field like engineered foods is that the terminology is always evolving. So let's stick with this example of engineered meat. Lab-grown meat, fake meat, cultured meat, alternative proteins, clean meat, vegan meat, these are all terms that are currently being used, and none of them have a set definition. What your marketing department may be calling your product may not be the best way to describe it in the patent office. So that's why you need somebody who's stayed abreast of both the current use of terminology and science and also how the patent office is examining applications to draft an application that will eventually lead to claims that you can obtain. Now, I know many practitioners have shied away from the use of definition sections in patent applications in recent years. They fear that by defining terms specifically in the application, the claims might be too narrow. Maybe they don't define it, you know, as broadly as you would want, and so they just avoid providing one altogether. But I think it's especially important in the engineered food space to make sure that everyone is on the same page, that you provide a definition that the examiner can readily understand and therefore target their searches and target the examination of your application appropriately. And an experienced patent lawyer should be able to craft definitions that are scientifically accurate and that encompasses the inventor's invention and the relevant design around products that the competitors might be developing. And such definitions are useful in clarifying what's being claimed and to clarify that it's not merely the naturally occurring version of the product. And also, although it's important in every application, it's doubly so in the engineered food space, you must consider claims to a variety of aspects of your invention. If getting claims to the product is going to be difficult, then you need to make sure that in your application you've described the process of making the product, how it's used, how it differs from the naturally occurring version, any special chemicals or machinery that's used to develop it. All of these things need to be considered when you're drafting the application. And one of the other things to answer your question about what companies might do to try to ensure that their application isn't rejected is it's going to be very important, as it has been, but even more so, for companies to keep up to date on the latest court cases related to these issues. This is a developing area, and so it's going to be important to watch all of those types of cases to see where the patent law seems to be going and also to try to get some sense of where it's going next as you are on the cutting edge of the development because the key is to drafting applications not only that will be issued today but that will withstand the test of time and possibly challenge by a competitor. And finally, Virginia, what are some recent notable examples of natural product or engineered food patents? Well, there's been some very interesting ones lately. Um, A couple of the ones that we have seen that I think will get some attention as the days move on are a crispy meat chip. It's an alternative to potato chips for those who prefer to have no carbs in their diet or they like the taste of it. It's covered by U.S. Patent 7662422. Another example is U.S. Patent number 8460726, which covers a method of making crackers using live probiotics. We've also seen things in very different fields. For example, a patent that now covers the method for making tea using red grapes. I suspect we'll see quite a few other 
engineered food patents that use red grapes in products because of the publicized benefits of grapes. So there are many different ancillary inventions in the field as well, given the food trends that we're seeing take place, particularly in the United States, but really worldwide, as people become more aware and more concerned about the types of products that they ingest. And I think that we will see that these trends continue to spur inventions of new machines, new gadgets, as well as patents that cover the end products that, while very similar to natural products, are not naturally occurring. That is, there's been some human intervention to arrive at the end product. I think that the work being done at Impossible Foods is impressive. They make the Impossible Burger, the one that's made from plants, but it tastes like meat because it uses that heme-containing protein, and that's that protein that's in red meat that makes it taste like meat. And to develop their patent portfolio, they've done several things that reflect the suggestions that we've been talking about here. For example, they have claims that are directed to a food flavor additive that comprises the heme-containing protein and other ingredients. And the claims specifically say that the flavor additive composition contains no animal products. So although the heme-containing protein may be a naturally occurring protein, they found ways to try to capture the combination of that with some of the other things that are important to create their plant-based burger. They're also pursuing claims directed to the plant that produces the heme-containing molecule. And again, because there is a naturally occurring plant that can produce that heme molecule, they have claims that have a negative limitation that explicitly excludes that naturally occurring plant. And so that's what they're pursuing now in the patent office. They've also gotten claims granted directed to, for example, they have a patent on a meat-like replica that contains the heme-containing protein with a specific protein sequence, one that isn't found in nature. And they're also pursuing many other varieties of claims to cover all the aspects of their invention, which I believe is a very smart move for such a game-changing invention, you need to make sure that you're covering every aspect that some competitor might try to copy. Our guests have been Virginia Karen and Jess Marks, attorneys at Finnegan, one of the largest IP law firms in the world. For more commentary on intellectual property news and issues, to listen to other podcasts, and to receive additional information on the firm, please visit www.finnegan.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Finnegan.